my name is Leela Kashtas. Uh, bit, before I start the presentation, I'd like to tell a little bit about myself. Well, since I have a big and complicated name, uh, you can call me Neil, but it's much crispier. And I'm from Mumbai, India. I've done my uh, bachelor's in uh, India as well as master's from Netherlands uh, with a background in mechanical engineering. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD candidate at the Laboratory of Respiratory Diseases. And I'm working on the thesis titled Intelligent Algorithm for Pulmonary Function Test. So basically, pulmonary function tests are uh, very common medical tests that are done to assess your respiratory health. But, we, but this test generates a lot of data. And what we are trying to do is by using a very multidisciplinary approach, the rating from signals processing, physics, computer science, machine learning, and pulmonary medicine. We're trying to make very advanced diagnostic tools that would help physicians to diagnose respiratory disorders with very high accuracy. Uh, I also maintain a blog, neilai.me. Most of the stuff uh, that I'll be talking about today, yeah, you can easily check out on the blog as well. So let's begin. Uh, before I start this presentation, I would first like to motivate why I'm doing this presentation. Uh, as everyone knows that there has been an explosion of deep learning applications recently. Uh, this is because the amount of data, data today that we have is increasing day by day due to rapid digitization of the society. Uh, and when I mean by data, it means like more labeled data. Now, uh, researchers have shown that if you use traditional machine learning models, like say, for instance, support vector your performance plateaus after some time, but as you increase the size of the models, you, your performance keep increasing. Uh, this is a direct result of uh, the bias variance spread off, but this is one of the important factors that is driving deep learning applications today. But one quick thing I want to say that when I mean by deep learning, I would refer to the class of models that are that looks like neural networks and that can be trained by backward propagation. So that is my reference by what I mean by deep learning. Another factor that has been driving rapid changes in deep learning application is the algorithmic improvements that we see day by day. Uh, if you see, this is a famous uh, competition called the ImageNet, uh, which is conducted by Stanford. Uh, and the task of this competition is to come up with a visual recognition uh, algorithm that could classify 1,000 different objects using around one and a half million images. Now, if you see the uh, years from 2010 to 2011, uh, there was hardly any improvement in the overall accuracy. It's not overall accuracy, it's like top 5 to but for the sake of argument, I use accuracy. But something happened in 2012, there has been a dramatic improvement uh, in the overall accuracy of the algorithm. In this year, Krzyzewski as well, they proposed a, a, an algorithm based on deep convolution neural networks, and they made it possible to train it by using really smart uh, algorithmic improvements. But there was one more thing that they used uh, to train this deep learning uh, model, and that is they have used GPUs. GPUs today have made it possible to train deep learning algorithms really, really faster. Uh, the advantages of GPU is that it has a high memory bandwidth together with a very reduced latency due to its uh, parallel architecture. And what happens is that it results in very fast computations that involve very large med sizes. And these computations are very, very faster, much quicker than the traditional CPUs. But at the same time, they are only adapted to very specific and repetitive tasks, unlike the CPUs, which are very good at doing very general tasks, such as maintaining the OS in the background and stuff like that. But GPUs are very adapted to one particular task, and that is solving large, doing large metric computations. Now, NVIDIA has made it possible today to train deep learning applications on their graphical processing units. As you know, their GPU cards, which we often use in gaming. And they have also reduced the uh, uh, programming uh, so, uh, programming platform called QDA, which basically provides different APIs so that uh, software developers can easily make tools to leverage the power of GPUs. And QDA is a library of uh, uh, routines of standard implementations of deep learning algorithms like forward and backward propagation that makes use of QDA. 
Today, QDNL is the uh, driving force, is the, uh, as we say, how do you that? It is the uh, driving uh, engine behind popular uh, deep learning frameworks such as TensorFlow to speed up their calculations on uh, GPU hardware. Okay, uh, let me give you a, a, a hypothetical, not a hypothetical situation, you know, a situation like, for instance, if you want to do a deep learning calculation today, for instance, if you are uh, looking forward to participate in a carrier competition, which are often now deep learning competitions, or you are uh, in a small startup uh, and looking forward to do, uh, do the first project, or even if you are a researcher uh, who is looking to uh, get some insights from the vast amount of data that you have recently collected, and you need to perform some deep learning computations. So you need to consider certain things such as uh, how big is your data set, what are the different modeling choices you have, and also time. Time is a big factor actually, and it's almost impractical. It's like I'll show you in the uh, uh, hands-on session. It's almost impractical to learn a deep learning like a very large computations on a PC, which often uses CPU, which actually uses CPU. I should have put CPU here. Now you may think that okay, I solve this problem by buying a GPU, but even a standard GPU is expensive and Buying a GPU will not solve your problem because you also need to have the available infrastructure to support the GPU card. You need to already have a working rig or uh, you need to buy a cooling fan or something in addition to that. But see, uh, you keep increasing your cost, so buying a GPU is not always the solution. And specifically, if you are looking to do, uh, 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 if you are looking to just experiment with deep learning or looking to train your first deep learning model. Now, for those of you researchers who who is probably doing a PhD and uh, thinking of uh, doing a deep learning computation using their high performance cluster that KU Human provides. Of course, it's very, very cheaper, but again, first of all, you need to ask permission from your uh, supervisor, whom I don't know how that will go. And uh, you also have certain wait times, and you need to apply for it, it takes some time to process a request, then you put your job in the line. There is a certain queue, and by the time you probably have loss interest in doing the calculation itself. Thus enters cloud computing. Cloud computing services such as Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure. These services, they provide really high-end compute resources, data center that compute capabilities at extremely cheap prices. And they are always available. You just need to plug your problem and play. But here is the catch. Getting started uh, with these uh, services is a bit tricky. There's a steep learning curve to it. And so what these companies have figured out that they have provided simply, they have simplified the entire process of uh, running your calculation, uh, running a deep learning calculation on the cloud. And when I mean by cloud here, I mean a GPU-based cloud server. So, so they have tried to simplify the entire process. For instance, Amazon provides uh, something called the Amazon SageMaker, uh, Google Cloud Platform provides something called the uh, Google Machine Learning Engine, and even there are other like companies which are trying to get into this market, some, some, uh, something like uh, the Floyd Hub. They try to simplify the entire process, but again, the thing is that these services are way more expensive than if you had just used the native services in the first place. And second, you are often constrained by the uh, interfaces that they provide, so you often lose a uh, certain amount of freedom uh, which often uh, and certain amount of freedom when you need to do some kind of a, some kind of customization in your algorithms and that is often in the case of real life scenarios. It's not like getting the accuracy you have to customize a lot of things in your algorithm and using their uh, services is a bit more constrained here. So this brings uh, to this tutorial uh, so what in this tutorial you will learn is that I will give you step by step how to use Amazon Web Services as well as Google Cloud uh, Platform Services for training a deep learning model. I'll uh, explain all these steps from scratch. I'll explain the various terminologies associated with it, uh, some uh, different tips and tricks that you can do so that you can train your models efficiently. Uh, the philosophy uh, behind uh, this hands-on session is that uh, as a scientist uh, or as an engineer, you should focus on the science of deep learning and not on the implementation details. 
that would take a lot of and it will actually waste a lot of time. Uh, so you, you need to have like a certain uh, prerequisites to know clearly what I'm talking about today. For instance, you need some knowledge of Python. I guess does everyone have some knowledge of Python? <laughs> uh, but don't worry. Uh, and also you need to know some deep learning libraries, but don't worry. I'm going to try to uh, simplify everything, simplify every step, so that tomorrow if you get a new deep learning project, you can immediately refer to this presentation and get started with training your first model. Okay, so let's start. So uh, the whole uh, process of doing a deep learning calculation uh, on, the, on a cloud server, on a cloud-based GPU server, goes through four basic steps. The first step is very simple, opening an account, which is just opening an account. Uh, second is creating a GPU instance. For in by instance, I mean a virtual server. Third is we'll connect to that instance, uh, and then we set up the deep learning problem on that instance. Okay, so let's start. This, this, these four basic steps are common for both. They're actually common for any uh, cloud services, uh, but we'll first talk about Amazon Web Services because they are the industry leader in the cloud computing platform. And then, if time permits, I'll also uh, go through how to do it in the case of uh, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, all right. So deep learning on AWS hands-on. So uh, the first step is just creating an AWS account. Okay. So now we land at something called the Amazon dashboard. Uh, if someone has already worked with it, we'll know this uh, interface already. So what we'll do is we'll first go to EC2. EC2 is the uh, EC2 is the uh, is, is, it stands for Elastic Cloud 2, which stands for Amazon's Cloud Computing Services. Uh, so we first go to EC2. Okay. So this is the interface where we'll be creating our first GPU instance. Uh, before I create an instance, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what types of instances out there on Amazon. So as I said, instance is a virtual server. It can be on demand. That means you can access it whenever you want to do. And there are also other types of instances such as pod instance, uh, which are cheap to use, but they are something like you have to bid on uh, using, you have to bid on the compute capabilities, uh, but flip, and you get like really steep discounts for using the instances. But uh, at the same time, if Amazon Web Services wants to use back for their own purpose, then you would have to forfeit all your calculations. Uh, and, and Amazon provides three types of GPU instances. They're all based on NVIDIA graphical processing unit. Uh, the, these instances are P2, which is a Tesla K80 graphics card, P3 Tesla M60, and P3 Tesla V100. And they're shown here in increasing orders of compute capabilities. A higher compute capability generally refers to much faster calculations. Now that I have explained the types of instances, let's go back to the AWS. So if you're starting off for the first time, the chances are you won't be immediately be able to create a, a <laughs> GPU instance. The main reason is that Amazon does not, Amazon wants the newcomers or beginners to ramp up their activity gradually and they want to decrease the likelihood of unexpected high bills. And also they want to, they want to save their infrastructure. So if you're starting for the first time, you have to go to instance, uh, you have to go to uh, something called the limits. Uh, let's go to limits. And here you see all the different instances. So when you're starting off for the first time, chances are if you have landed on the limits page, uh, you won't find, you won't be immediately be able to see the limit as uh, So the first thing I would recommend you to do uh, is uh, say if you want to run your deep learning computation, uh, and say if you have chosen P2 instance here, you should go and click request limit increase. So in my case, I already have a limit of one over here. That means why I'm good to go. Always go by default. I always choose US East Ohio because that data center provides all the instances in Europe. And it's always cheaper. Don't go for the European instances. European data centers, they are slightly more expensive. So to launch the instance, we just go and click launch instance. And, and the first thing you would be prompted is to choose the uh, image, the Amazon machine image, which basically is the OS and 
uh, which, which basically is it contains all the instructions uh, as well as all the libraries that would require to perform your deep learning calculations. Uh, for instance, in our case, the appropriate image would be this one, deep learning EMI. It comes with a Ubuntu 17.0, plus it also uh, comes pre-installed with all the uh, popular deep learning frameworks. Plus also, of course, it has also CUDA and CUDA and then installed. So we just go and select it. Next thing is to choose the instance type. In my case, I'm going to proceed with the uh, uh, P2X large over here, which costs something around 90 cents an hour. And this is the GPU I'm, I'm gonna be GPU instance I'm gonna be using, but you guys can go ahead and choose the uh, T2, T2 micro instance. Uh, I'll keep this things at default as it is. Uh, at storage uh, for a GPU instance, you cannot go anything below 75 GB, so I'll keep it as it is. At tax, uh, I will also not change anything. Configure security group will keep all the timing as it is right now. So we just go and go ahead and click review and launch. Launch here. I'll be prompted to create a private key for my instance. So think of it much like a password for it. So I'll not, I'll create a new uh, key pair and I'll, I'll maybe demo uh, AWS and I'll download the key pair. So I'm just launch the instance. Yeah, my instance is up and running right now. Uh, and you can see all the details of this P2X large. So the next thing what we are going to do is we're going to connect to the GPU instance, which brings to the first step. So uh, what, we are doing, what we are going to do is going to make a, a SSH connection. Uh, and for this purpose, uh, if you're working on Windows, it's much easier to have the client puppy installed. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, I think that's can uh, handle the terminal, terminal app is here, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I also, uh, just for those who don't have Windows, I put the commands yeah. in a folder, in a file called SSH something, remember, uh, on the Google Drive folder. Yeah. So I describe the commands, how you should do it, mm -hmm. uh, and then when we do it together, I can go and pass by and it's just better as well. And less, otherwise for Windows, you have to For well, Windows, uh, downloading party makes life much easier. And, uh, for, and you also need a file transfer client. Uh, this client will be used to trans uh, transfer all our training data as well as training scripts onto the instance. So, okay, uh, if you have opened uh, Putty, for the host name, the default username always for Amazon instances is Ubuntu. So, and we just go ahead and type Ubuntu at the rate. We just copy the public DNS over here and just paste it over here. Okay. So the next thing what we are going to do is we are going to load the keys which we have already downloaded. Uh, now, if you go uh, to the keys you, you have already downloaded, we, we downloaded a key called, in my case, I downloaded something called uh, the, uh, the demo AWS PM, that was the key I downloaded. But the problem with Putty is that you cannot uh, directly use this key because it is in, it is in .pm format. So I need to first convert it to .ppk format, which Putty can uh, uh, identify. So for this, if you have downloaded Putty, uh, you will, it will also come with another tool called Putty Gen, like this one. So it is a generator. Uh, you can convert the .pem file into .ppk file, which Putty identifies. So we load it. Uh, all files. Take this here, and it's gonna throw some more, but we just now it has converted, we just save it the private key, it's more detail like password right like now. So we just write demo key. Sorry, I'll just write demo AWS and save in the yes. So this is the uh, this is the converted dot ppk format. Uh, this is the converted key in dot ppk format. So now what we are going to do is just browse over here. Uh, 
uh, go to the file, uh, folder where we have saved that uh, file, and this is my file demo AWS. So just double click it, open it, and it will uh, say something. You just warning that you just go ahead and trust it. And yes, you are in the terminal now. So basically, now this is a terminal where you're going to be passing various commands. To run the so I hope everyone is in uh, this welcome screen and here what you can see is that the system comes uh, preloaded with different Python environments. Uh, now ideally you should activate only that environment which contains all the libraries for which your script was written in the first place. So I'm just going to go and uh, activate my environment. Uh, so here, it will, for the first time, it will uh, it will download some files to the instance. Uh, it should be done in a couple of minutes. Okay, my installation is done, and now what I'm going to do is just uh, reboot reboot the instance so that it won't cause any further hiccups. Like, so I'll just uh, uh, go activate my uh, uh, Python environment, which is TensorFlow E36. And so you are now in the working within the environment of Type TensorFlow P36 that contains all the uh, Keras and TensorFlow libraries. So this was all about connecting to the instance. I will also open my uh, file transfer uh, client now, uh, which will be very useful for transferring our uh, tra uh, training scripts and training data as well. Uh, so I'll just go and open uh, WinSCP. I, I think you can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I just for the host name, uh, just sorry, not this one because it's a different host. Uh, go to your instance. Uh, copy this. Copy this. Uh, your IP address of the instance. Uh, Copy paste here. Uh, for the username, is, as I said, it's always Ubuntu. Ubuntu, and then click Advanced. Uh, then go to Authentication, and you just load the same private key which you had previously used to connect to the uh, connect to the instance using Putty. So here, in this case, is Demo AWS. I'll go ahead and connect it, and so you are in the. Uh, in the, so you are in the so here basically here uh, on the right you can access all the uh, folders uh, and the file directories that are already installed in the GPU instance. So this was the third step uh, in this process. Now you are almost done. Uh, uh, so we have gone through three steps. Now the last step that is remaining is setting up your deep learning uh, problem. Uh, so here as uh, you you will need a training script. And, and, uh, and training data. Uh, so in this case, in this tutorial, uh, I'll be sh demonstrating a problem which was taken from uh, Kaggle, which uh, it was a recent challenge called the Kaggle pneumonia detection problem, where you were provided with different X-ray images, and the task was to detect this uh, bounding boxes, which defines the opacity in the lungs. We'll not discuss much about the problem, but I'll just demonstrate this uh, uh, exercise. Quick word, I'm not going to use the entire data set because it was around 10 GB. So I'm going to use a very small sample data set of around 100 examples because it's going to take forever. And I also jam data camps uh, bandwidth as well. So what we do is uh, we now here, uh, we are at the file transfer client. So what we're going to do is we will uh, we'll create a new directory over here. Uh, we'll just write it as demo. Uh, and this go over here. And now I'll transfer my training script and my train data. I created a separate folder. So in this case, I'm I'll transfer my demo train script and my demo data. So. It's it's around. It's around. 
it's it was quick i did not expect that okay but i i'm also going to uh, uh use a script called some helper functions but don't worry about it uh, it's just a set of functions that i also use to train my uh, algorithm so my uh, uh my training script looks something like this. This is just a pseudo code over here. So I'll just give you an example. So I first load my training data and validation data. So this data comes back together in the demo data file that I just transferred. So this demo data contains both uh, the training data and validation data. It also contains the feature X and the Y labels that we are we often know uh, that we are accustomed to in machine learning language. So we first define a training model over here using some parameters. Uh, and then we basically, uh, we first construct the model graph. So in modern uh, machine learning frameworks, you need to first construct the computation graph and then just uh, pass the command to fit it, uh, train the model. And then there is a separate function for the evaluating the model, something like you need to calculate the accuracy or judge how good the model was. Uh, like validation accuracy or something. And this is the very generic training process. You train the model by passing the parameters. You then calculate the validation metric. Very simple, generic training script. So this was also my uh, very generic training script. Uh, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this training script. Uh, uh, to open this training script over here, it looks something like this. Okay. Okay. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside my uh, demo directory. So, uh, so I'll do it by CD demo. Okay. And now I'm going to run this demo train script that uses this demo data and some evaluating functions, which are in the helper functions uh, to do some calculations. So let's do it. Just type Python. Uh, demo train script, it will automatically clone and yeah, just put enter. And so I have done this uh, script for five epochs. So it's like five iterations of batch, not batch reading, five epochs. He's faster than you. Huh? Okay. It's so weird. Huh? He's faster than you. No, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's because you are using a CPU. So in CPU, you're uh, it's uh, using C4, C4 large, C4 yeah. large. Yeah, it's still CPU. It's it's CPU. CPU. Yeah. But uh, yeah. but if you run, if you run the script, yeah, yeah. What was the run time again for you? I was talking about finish. Finish. It's not as yeah. it's No, no. But the first two or three steps were good. Yes, yes. I have timed the calculations, so you can see the runtime of training the script. Uh, yeah, overhead. Yeah. yeah. So it is, the first one was very long because you had to probably spin up that. Yeah, first time you need to like, yeah. Yeah, first time you, there is some initial latency, but once the latency is covered, then because of its parallel structure, oh, it's just yeah, yeah, very yeah. long. It was around 40 seconds where uh, 40 seconds. 14. 14 seconds, yeah, you see, the total time is yeah. here is just 42 seconds and for those of you who are in the yeah. So yeah, so, so what I'm going to show is that, uh, okay, so, uh, if you guys have done this uh, computation, congratulations, you can now you have run your first deep learning calculation on the cloud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to for a for fun sake I'm just going to run it on my own uh, on the CPU of that instance instead of using the GPUs. So for this I'll just uncomment some lines over here, which basically will instruct uh, the uh, the script to use the only the available CPUs. Just go ahead and save it and uh, rerun the calculation setting. So remember this was only 42 seconds. Yeah. Let's see how much it takes for the same problem for the same number of reports. Okay, so it will take some time. It will take some time. So that's that's you see that's what you see is like how GPU will 
tremendously accelerate your uh, deep learning calculation and it's almost impossible to run this on your CPU. Okay, you see uh, the time difference. Uh, with the CPUs, it was around one, one and a half minutes. With the GPUs, it was only 42 seconds for the same computation. So now I'll show some uh, tips and tricks uh, with the Amazon AWS uh, so that you can efficiently uh, train your algorithm. The first thing uh, that you must know is the different pricing. So the Amazon EC2 is charged per hour uh, and uh, the, the pricing is directly proportional to the compute capabilities of the GPU as well as the number of GPUs you would be using. Uh, the pricing also depends on region, as you say, like for instance, I've always found that the uh, data centers in the US are always cheaper than the data centers uh, in Frankfurt or, uh, or, other, or Ireland, for instance. Uh, and one more thing, very important, to, important thing to consider is that the EC2 is not only charged based on the computation resources used, but it, they also will charge you on the storage, data storage. And they use an interesting unit for the GB days. Uh, it's like the number of GB you store multiplied by the number of days. So for instance, if you store one GB of data over an entire month, so it's basically one into 30, so it becomes 30 GB days. And coincidentally, 30 GB days is also the free tire limit, like until that amount you can uh, use the AWS without incurring any additional charges. But if you go over the 30 GB days, Amazon will charge you for sure. And there is also a, a cost involved with the data transfer uh, that would incur if you transfer data such as your training data in this case to and from to and fro uh, the instance. So these are the different things you have to consider uh, while uh, using an instance. You have to, yeah, pricing is uh, very important, and especially always. Just remember to stop your terminate the instance whenever you are not using it because uh, if you don't stop it or terminate it, uh, uh, even if the instance is lying idle, the instance will still be running and Amazon would keep charging you by the hour. Uh, so always be mindful of that aspect. Uh, and yeah, if you stop the instance, uh, although you won't be charged for Amazon AWS computing resources, but you would still you would be still charged for the uh, storage should you exceed their uh, free tire storage uh, service. Okay, uh, now one of the things that I that in the calculation which I showed you now deep learning calculations as uh, often takes a lot of time. It's not like five seconds or forty seconds. It takes often hours or sometimes days or even weeks. And, uh, and what the current flip side of using this instance is that you have to keep the instance running if you want to keep the calculations, uh, uh, if you don't want to lose the calculations, you want to keep it running, you need to, you need to keep, you need to open the, con uh, you need to keep your connections open. Uh, but there is a workaround over this. So what we are going to you, what I'm going to show you is how to keep your calculations running even when you're not connected to the instance. And that is very important because sometimes impractical to keep your own laptop up and running all the time. So I'll show you quickly how that works. So for this purpose, I'm going to be using something called uh, the terminal multiplexer, such as a GNU screen. Uh, to do this, uh, what I'm going to do is go, to, go back to my instance and just type screen over here. And you see, now I'm using a terminal multiplexer. So what I'm going to do is because I want to uh, increase the number of epochs, epochs so that I can show you that the calculations are still running. Otherwise the calculations will just run out even before we close it. What is, I'll just access my uh, thing, uh, just my script over here, which is on the instance and increase the number of epochs to say 100. Okay. So now I'm on the GNU screen and now the process is again the, exactly the same thing you will do. You will just type Python and run the script, which is demo. So I now have gone back into my environment. Now I go to the directory where I have this. 
What was the advantage to use a screen? What was sorry? the advantage to use a screen? Uh, the advantage of using the screen is that you will not lose your calculations if you are disconnected from the instance. So right now the problem is that you have to keep your instance uh, laptop up and running or the uh, your uh, connection up and running if you want to continue your calculations. But with the advantage of screen is that you can just close it and I'll show you. Okay. Uh, it, it yeah, yeah, I get it. So you can submit jobs here with a patch or something like this to the server and it will be the same? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry? You can do a patch and submit your job and then it will be running in the background? Yeah, it's something like that. Yes, it is also possible to do that way, but this is another way to do yeah, it. Like, but now I'm going to uh, close this screen to simulate the force disconnection. Uh, so now I will yeah. log back to my... Uh, so now to look get back into the screen I'll simply type screen slash r dash r so if there are two screens already running, so I'll just see which one is running. Yeah, see, now I have gone back to the screen and the calculation was still running, even when I was disconnected uh, from the instance. Okay, I'll, I'll try to run a bit quickly because uh, uh, it's, uh, the time is almost getting over. Uh, so. Yeah, a practical step is to always uh, debug your script completely before uh, before running because otherwise if you just switch, if, you are, if your instance is on you start debugging then you start losing money basically so and also you have much uh, debugging friendly tools such as spider to debug it offline okay uh, now you can also uh, configure Jupyter notebooks uh, using the Amazon AWS. Uh, I was uh, planning to show you how to do it, but uh, it should take some time right now. But don't worry, I'll post the link how to do it. It's a very easy uh, way to do it. But I would not recommend if if Jupyter notebooks are very visual and if it works for you, then feel free to go ahead. But why I don't recommend it is that you need to keep your browser on all the time. Uh, and the, mo the moment you close the browser, you will again lose all the calculations. The same problem, your deep learning problems are deep learning computation is probably going to take hours or weeks or days sometimes. So it's almost impractical to keep your browser tab open. That contains it's the same screens, isn't it? You can still try no, you can keep the calculation running, but uh, at the same, you will, you, because when you open a Jupyter notebook, you're also creating, you're connecting to the uh, Jupyter server as well. Yeah. So when you're closing the browser, you are disconnecting that connection as well. So I will post a link how to do it, uh, but uh, because these are some more interesting things to discuss over here. Uh, okay, when you're doing a, a, a deep learning calculations, you need to know, and often I'm, when I do a deep learning calculation, it will take a lot of time. So I need to get some progress reports, like at what stage, what kind of metrics I'm seeing, uh, whether should I change the uh, learning rate a bit, a little bit or not. So you need to uh, keep track of different metrics when you learn, when you do a deep learning calculation. Uh, now, there are two ways uh, you can do. One is by doing uh, manual text file dumps. Uh, so what is basic, I will, uh, it basically means is that, uh, so, and sure, so this is my uh, generic training script uh, where you uh, define a function, how to train the model. So here is the function where you actually uh, where you fit, where you provide the fitting command, where, uh, where when you give this command model.fit, you basically your batch propagation, uh, sorry, uh, backward propagation uh, starts. So here to get different kinds of, uh, uh, different kinds of data, different kinds of metrics, there are different callback functions available. Now I'm not going to tell you uh, what that is, but, uh, you can always pass something called the callbacks. Now, different libraries, I, I know for a fact that almost all the uh, deep learning libraries, uh, 
support this callback functionality. Uh, in the case of Keras, TensorFlow, they also you can uh, define callbacks. So callbacks is nothing but a function. Here you can define some function over here, some function here, which which will basically which will basically take take the different uh, logs of the uh, trading uh, trading algorithm. For instance, it will uh, take the epoch number uh, with the batch number, the uh, the validation, uh, sorry, the training accuracy at that uh, epoch number. So it will basically collect different metrics at uh, using this callback function, and what you can do is, uh, you, within this callback function, you can uh, once you define it. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you the command, uh, but you can define this thing, and then you can uh, within this sum function, uh, you can manually dump some text files uh, into your own instance. So if I here within now, if I define this text sum function somewhere over here, uh, and I'll just give a print command. Uh, of the various metrics that would be obtained from uh, the deep learning computation. So this is done while training a single model, but usually we also do a lot of hyperparameter optimization. So this is the generic code for hyperparameter optimization. You have the same uh, two lines. Uh, you have a uh, code for training the model. You have a code for evaluating the model. But now you wrap these two functions inside the cost function for hyperparameter hyper optimization. So here, in, within the cost function, you train the model, you get the validation metric, and if you want to keep track of the different validation metrics at different stages of evaluation, you can again dump a text file over here onto your instance. Uh, because uh, even though if you have put it as a print command, the chances are that uh, if you have used screen to run this entire calculation, uh, your computations won't have access to that output screen immediately. Uh, so it's much better that you dump a text file when you use uh, to hyperparameter optimization. Now there is another uh, uh, interesting uh, thing you can do is you can actually set up email alerts for the different stages of uh, different to to notify yourself of the progress of a deep learning uh, deep learning problem deep learning computation. So I'll quickly show how to do this with Amazon simple email service. So what this will do basically is that as the training progresses, as the hyperparameter uh, optimization progresses, you will get alerts at different intervals. You can everything customize yourself. And, you, and this is also a very interesting idea to include uh, this functionality at the end of your training script so that it will notify you when the calculations are complete and you should come and open the instance and. Uh, take out all the necessary results out and close the instance so, so that you don't end up wasting a lot of time and money as well. So I'll show you how to set up an email alert system with Amazon email service. Uh, so to do this, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to use Amazon's uh, simple email uh, service. So to uh, go to the EC2 dashboard, I'm at the EC2 dashboard now. Uh, I'll just go and click uh, simple email service. Now my region, the region which I have used is US Ohio. Uh, it does not support this service. The only region in the US I think that supports, uh, there are two regions actually. Uh, you can choose US East North Virginia uh, that actually supports this uh, functionality. So now I'm in the simple email interface. So first I'm going to go to the uh, email addresses. So you have to first verify an email ID with which you are going to send and receive the uh, text alerts. Um, you can do, you can just verify a single email ID because I, if you just want to use the same email ID to send yourself the alerts. Uh, for, in my case, I will uh, use my own email ID. So they will use this email ID to send text on my, so it's basically like sending mails to yourself. Yeah, so thank God I got on my KU and <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, congrats. <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right, my email ID is verified. The next step, what I'm going to do is download the root keys uh, of, of the AWS account. So these root keys basically allow you to programmatically access your AWS account. So it's very different from your instance private keys which are only used to access your instance. So to, uh, to, to get those root keys, go to IAM, 
identity and access management. Uh, click delete your root keys, uh, manage security credentials, uh, continue to security credentials, and go to the access keys over here and, and create a new access key. Now download the key file where you can easily I just delete it and I just see. Can, can you go back just a second? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I basically I first set up the e I verified my email address now. Yeah. No, then okay. then what I did was I went to I in I yeah. identity access. Access and management. Yeah. I click delete your root keys. Manage security credentials. Yeah. Uh, go to the access keys, access key ID and secret access uh, to this here. And then you create click this create one. New. Okay. Uh, don't worry, all this stuff is written on my blog, so you can just <laughs> follow it. So I'm just trying to show you quickly. Uh, then what I have uh, written here is a simple uh, wrapper. Uh, there is a, the, the script is already available from Amazon how to programmatically send emails from your instance. But I have written a very simple and intuitive uh, uh, wrapper which simple it looks something like uh, this. Uh, to use this wrapper, you first you have to download this file uh, called uh, AWS EC2 mail. It will direct to you my GitHub page, uh, and then you can. Uh, Go to this. I show you the script. Uh, so this is if you go to my GitHub page, if you follow that link, you will. Uh, I have basically defined the wrapper over here, which provides a very simple, uh, uh, very simple uh, API to programmatically send emails, and uh, this is the. Uh, it is as simple as this. So if you import this uh, library called AWS EC2 mail, which you will find on my GitHub page, and then after importing, it is as simple as defining all these uh, various parameters for sender, recipient, subject, the body of the email, and of course, yes, the AWS region. So this region should be the same where the region which you chose to verify your email address. In this case, the region was US North Virginia. And then you just invoke send the email by invoking uh, by setting is this command awscc 2 mailsender it's as simple as that so i will just uh, show you uh, how this works uh, by by modifying my own script so in this demo file i will just uh, now uh, transfer this required uh, aws ec2 email which you will again as i said find on that link i transfer this script and also the root keys which you have just downloaded. Which actually not just uh, and just drag and drop over here. So now you're good to go. I'll just uh, change. Now this snippet I have already written over here, but I need to change the sender and recipient because I was quite sure it wasn't gonna work with my Gmail. Okay, the subject is computations done, validation, precision is something. So let's run this. And the region also? Huh? The region was also correct. The region was. Yeah, the region was important. Uh, yeah. It's the same region where you have uh, uh, chosen to open your simple email service. So let's just run it. Okay, yeah. No, we don't need so many things. Just do it. And. Let's see. <laughs> yes, email sent. Now I should get an email. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>